And I thought, why not try and really push the envelope on this technology, right? Why not really see what it can do uh, in a way that I, you know, I couldn't accomplish in, 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 you know, before it. So I had this thought like, well, what if, what if I co-wrote with AI, but instead of writing it, we performed it. In today's episode, Jay shares how in April 2023, Chat GPT-4 changed the trajectory of his Amazon book sales and his aha moment for Gen AI's impact on publishing and beyond. Discover Jay's prompt to process and innovative role-playing approaches to co-writing with AI. We also discuss the publishing industry's landscape pre- and post-Gen AI how AI is enabling greater accessibility for writers and the need to support all writers and stop review bombing. We discuss the potential impact of AI on the entertainment industry as we know it, the importance of teaching responsible AI use in the classroom, how creators can leverage digital books and the need for kindness and empathy as we navigate this new creative landscape. How can you harness the power of AI to unleash your creativity? Listen in to find out. Enjoy. Have you ever thought, what if this is all just a dream? Welcome to Creativity Squared. Discover how creatives are collaborating with artificial intelligence in your inbox, on YouTube, and on your preferred podcast platform. Hi, I'm Helen Todd, your host, and I'm so excited to have you join the weekly conversations I'm having with amazing pioneers in the space. The intention of these conversations is to ignite our collective imagination at the intersection of AI and creativity to envision a world where artists thrive. Well, Jay, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you on Creativity Squared. Thanks, Helen. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, well, um, We'll get into your origin story, but Jay and I actually met through Beehive, which has come up a few times on the show. It's a fantastic newsletter platform. Uh, We both have AI newsletters. Um, So that led to one phone call. And then Jay actually came down to the Cincy AI Meetup for Humans that I co-hosted. So I actually have got to meet him in real life, which was really (laughs) fantastic. Uh, And it's so wonderful uh, to have you on on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a great event. I'm sure we'll, we'll touch upon it in, the, in this conversation. Yeah. Well, those, uh, for those who are meeting you for the first time, uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us uh, your origin story? Yes. Uh, my name is Jay Thorne, and I am an um, independent publisher and author, um, self-employed since around 2017. I uh, started as a sort of my professional career as a classroom teacher I taught everything from uh, middle school math to entrepreneurship. And uh, after about 23 years in the classroom, I, I, uh, I, I started uh, publishing novels on Amazon. This was around 2009. And uh, by 2017, I was kind of ready to, to go out on my own. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Fantastic. And, and AI played a very big uh, trajectory uh, this year uh, for you as well. So can you tell us about the, the moment that changed things for you and your, and your writing? Yes. Uh, so my, my good friend, Joanna Penn, uh, and I have, uh, we've been in this together for a long time and we've co-written together and um, hung out in, in, in the real world and done trips and things. And so we have a, we have a regular catch up call. And over the past couple of years, she's, repeatedly told me like you have to you have to look at this generative ai stuff and i always you know i always pay attention to what she says because she's one of the smartest people i've ever met uh but every time i tried it i just wasn't impressed like it you know it didn't it didn't really i didn't really see a lot of potential and and this started back with a program called pseudo right probably like two years ago now and uh, joanna was following it and, and chat gp2 two came out and and then three, and then 3.5. And every time I tried it, it got a little bit better, but it was just, I just wasn't impressed. And, and I kept thinking like, whatever I get out of here, it's going to take me so long to revise it into what I need. I might as well just write it and from the beginning. Like it's not saving me any time or anything. And then April of, of this year rolled around and, and, and four came out and I thought, okay, well, I'm using 3.5. This is version four. It's like a half step better, right? 
And uh, I didn't realize how wrong I was in that assumption in that the difference between the free version of chat GPT uh, as of recording, this is 3.5 and four was phenomenal. And I knew within a matter of minutes that this was going to completely transform not only the, the publishing industry, but, uh, I mean, most of most of our society. I mean, I, I just saw the impacts, the potential impacts in so many different industries and, and places, and and that was the moment for me. It, w- it was those first couple, uh, first couple minutes on Chat GPT four back in in April or so that really changed everything for me. Yeah, I, I love that that it was like such an aha moment the first time that you played with Chat GPT four. Uh, which we'll going to get into your process and your prompts uh, a little bit uh, down the show, because I'm sure everyone listening is very curious on that front. Um, But before we go there, I'd love to kind of start with just kind of like the lay of the land of the publishing industry. Because when we talk about AI, we talk about it being this big disruptor, but I think it's nice to zoom out and kind of see the lay of the land pre-AI and then talk about the impact of that. So you've been an independent writer for a while. So can you kind of give us the the state of publishing pre-AI and kind of where you see it now too? <laughs> yes. I'll, uh, I, I might not be the most qualified person, but I'll certainly, certainly give you my perspective. Uh, and, I, and I know that, um, you know, from listening to the podcast, you have a lot of different creatives on from different industries. So this might be brand new for, for a lot of listeners. Uh, I think, you know, the publishing industry is, is, is pretty traditional in that it's been around for a very long time. Uh, I mean, you know, going back a, a century or more, there's been a publishing industry of sorts. And when Amazon rolled out what was called Kindle Direct Publishing in 2008 or 2009, which coincided with their uh, development and release of the Kindle e-reader, it radically transformed pu- uh, publishing. It, it was the first time in the history of publishing where uh, anybody um, with a, an internet uh, uh, access could log into KDP and they could upload a Word document or uh, a formatted file and sell it as a book on Amazon. And that was really revolutionary at the time. And that really put the pressure on the traditional publishing industry, the what we call the big five, which might be big four now, depending on how you, how you group them. But the New York publishers, the traditional publishers, Simons and Schuster's and, and and of those variety, you know they have they have very monolithic, massive publishing um, empires. They're they're sort of like a, a a big Titanic or a cruiser, and when they're moving through the water, they have to make these really slow turns. And then starting in around 2009, uh, 2010, you had the independent publishers uh, came onto the scene and extremely nimble. So think like a little tugboat or you know a speedboat darting around the harbor able to make re- very quick changes um, very easily. And, and you you had kind of had these two different models of publishing that have existed up until, uh, well, up until now and, and including now. And there've been debates about, you know, which is better, should you, you know, look for an agent and, and have your agent try and sell your manuscript to a publisher or should you be an independent publisher and, and do it on your own? And then there's pros and cons uh, from both sides. But what's increasingly happened over the past 10 years, uh, and this is prior to AI, is there have been a, a lot of opportunities for scammers to take advantage of some of the programs that Amazon has rolled out. So, for example, they have a, pro- a program for readers called Kindle Unlimited, where you pay a monthly subscription fee and then you can basically read as many books as you want that are within the program. And the way the authors are compensated in that program is Amazon will pay them for every page that's read. So you, your pages get logged as an aggregate. Uh, and then there's a big pie of money that Amazon has, and they divide that up based on the number of pages that are read and, and the number of authors. And so scammers started figuring out how to get, how, how to like put links in to draw people to the back of the book, which would then register 200 pages read. Like these were some of the early, the early scams. And that's gotten progressively worse. It's a cat and mouse game. You know, Amazon is trying to keep these scammers from coming on the platform. They find new ways around it. And then you have generative AI enters the picture. (laughs) And now scammers who may have taken, like they they may have stolen books and did some copy and pasting, or they may have even paid, um, they may have paid people to write these books. Uh, You know, it, it, it took them a, a little bit more time. And now with generative AI, they can sort of crank out these books at a, at a much faster rate. So 
I would say that uh, although AI is just the latest in this, I think that publishing industry started going into this moment of transition as this time of change about 15 years ago. And uh, it's very unsettling. And there are a lot of people who have been in the industry for a long time who aren't really sure what to do. And, and what about the user behavior? Because not only are you on Amazon, but user behavior and reading books has changed. Uh, can you talk about that landscape too? Because it's, it's always been kind of an uphill battle for authors and it just seems to be more and more uphill battle uh, elements uh, being introduced on the paths, I guess. Yes. Uh, several of my friends who have come from traditional publishing, uh, one of them started uh in the nineties. Uh, and so she's seen a lot of, of this. And I think what we're seeing now, uh, especially from the author perspective is that, uh, authors aren't competing with other authors. Um, I think that's been a, a misconception that some of my colleagues have had. Authors are competing with TikTok and, and Facebook and Instagram and Netflix and just the wide variety of entertainment sources that we have available to us. And because of that, and, and really in any metric you want to measure it, people are just reading less. Even if that reading is things like email newsletters or blogs, they're, they're reading fewer books than they ever have before. And I think that makes it uh, much more of a challenge. It, it's definitely harder than, than it's been. And at the same time, while demand is decreasing, supply is increasing exponentially. So again, even way before AI came onto the scene, you know, Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing platform allowed uh, anyone to publish a book. And, and there are mi literally millions and millions of books on Amazon now, most of which are never even opened. Uh, but what that does for the reader experience is it makes it harder to find stuff. Like you, you almost have to know what you want to read as opposed to browsing for something because there's just too much. Yeah, and it, it almost puts the onus um, somewhat on the algorithms too to help surface uh good content or um, like Ben Nash, who is at our Cincy AI meetup and also interviewed on the show, um, just uh, also spoke to the importance of building your reputation and building, building your community. Uh, but one thing that you shared is among authors, you're kind of um, an anomaly in embracing AI and that a lot of authors haven't uh, embraced it quite like you. So I was wondering if you could kind of speak to what you're seeing in uh, through this lens as well. I absolutely will, although I want to preface with what I'm going to say with uh, an acknowledgement of my privilege. I am a, uh, a straight, white, middle-aged white guy, and therefore I'm not uh, subject to some of the uh, attacks or rhetoric that some of my, my colleagues are which is very unfortunate. And, and we can get into why we think that's the case in, in a little bit. Um, so, so yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm a bit fearless in that. I, I'm not really worried about what people say. I've, uh, part of it is because the majority of my revenue is not generated from my fiction sales. Most of, most of my personal income is from uh, book coaching, developmental editing, client work, uh, publishing nonfiction books, so in a way, I, uh, I really have an advantage in that I don't really have to care what, what most folks think. And I quite honestly came into AI very skeptical, and, and I still am to a certain degree. The other part of it is I've always had an entrepreneurial mindset, and I think part of being an entrepreneur is the, is the willingness to take risks and to try things and to be on what's often called the bleeding edge. <laughs> uh, you, know, you're, you might get injured, you might suffer some setbacks, but as an early adopter, I, I, I love to try things. And, and then what I really like to do is to kind of uh, figure it out and then turn around and help other people and explain it, you know, explain it for them and show them uh, how it can be used. So uh, if I look back over my personal history, I've always gravitated towards technological advancements, but I would like to think that I'm uh, somewhat cautiously optimistic. I don't jump in for the sake of, of jumping in. I, I'm looking for the angle. I'm looking for the leverage that that particular tool is going to give me in whatever job or task I'm working on. And, and in terms of the, well, uh, one thing that we discussed too are for the authors who have not embraced AI, 
that they've done these things like review bombing to other authors. And some of the some of the benefits of AI is actually accessibility for authors as well. So I was wondering if you could speak to that because I want to also put out a little PSA announcement that we support all writers, <laughs> whether they use AI or not use AI. And I think this is something important uh, uh, to highlight as well. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate that fear really drives a lot of people's behavior. And and there's a lot of fear around generative AI right now, not just in author communities, but but in society in general. There's, you know, a lot of doomsday scenarios and and one of the unfortunate byproducts of that is people lash out at things that they don't understand. And what's really unfortunate is when some authors do that uh openly and publicly against other authors. And so uh, a review bomb is when an author will ask a bunch of their friends or another group of authors to go and leave a one star, the lowest review on Amazon, on a book by an author who used AI. And it could be anything. It could be they use AI for part of the cover or they use AI in their editing, not even necessarily generating the, the text, which is sort of like the biggest taboo within this mindset. And what's so unfortunate about that is they don't really have the whole picture. Uh, a lot of these groups uh, that are review bombing, they don't realize that AI is giving voice to people who haven't had it before. Uh, there are authors who have physical limitations, uh, disabilities, um, unfortunate circumstances, and they haven't been able to write or they had to stop writing for some reason. And now AI is giving them the opportunity to do that again. And, and they, they're doing it to express themselves. And some of them are doing it to, to make a little bit extra money and or may, maybe make the car payment that month or put groceries on the table. And these review bombers and, and these other authors who are attacking them are attacking their livelihood. And uh, it's just really sad. And it, it's, um, I hope it stops. I think it's something that probably will. I think a year from now, we, we probably won't be talking about this. But it's the kind of thing that's happening right now that's really unfortunate. And uh, and I'm in a place where I can kind of stand up to that, but I also understand there are, you know, some of my peers can't because then they will become targets of these mobs. Yeah, it's, it makes me so sad to hear this. So, um, yes, please stop. <laughs> Hopefully this will stop. And uh, Jay and I uh, joked before we started recording that, you know, on the show, um, we say that AI is a mirror for society, but we, we've had that mirror in lots of different forms. And, and definitely one of those are Amazon review and YouTube comments as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I, I do really appreciate um, that you bring up accessibility because the web, uh, definitely web 2.0 was not built with um, disabled people in mind. And we have the promise with voice tech being the, the voice interface and with AI to really uh, make it a more leveling field for more uh, people to participate in the democratization of creativity. Uh, so that's that gives a lot of promise uh, for these new tools. Um, and one thing that you said, you kind of hinted at a second ago, is that in a year it will be a non-starter because I, my prediction, which I think we're in agreement, is all the people who are saying, complain about AI will uh, probably be using it in some capacity uh, in a year anyway, right? I, I agree. Uh, a few years ago, I was uh, really enamored with blockchain and NFT technology. And one of the, one of the legitimate criticisms of that, which I think is, is why it's, it's really uh, in a downturn at the moment, is that it was extremely hard to get into. You know, like if you were going to buy crypto, you had to you had to sign up for an exchange and then you had to have a wallet and you had to have your seed phrase. And like the average listener is already like, forget that I'm already out. Right. <laughs> and, and I think that's the, that's what's different about AI is that it doesn't, not only does it not require the mainstream or the average or the normie to, to do anything, it's becoming baked into a lot of things. Um, so we're seeing it, you know, Google is building it into a generous search engine. Amazon is, is including it in their ad platform it's going to be part of mobile devices. It's going to be part, it, it's just going to be there. And, and you're not even going to, you, know, you might not even realize you're using AI. And because it's going to be so ubiquitous, I think, I, I hope that these arguments about creatives using AI, that it's, that it's somehow cheating or that, or that they're creating art that's taking 
sales away from other artists, real artists, quote unquote, real artists who are not using AI. Like, I think, I think those all might just fade away because it's just going to be part of everything. Yeah. And I think most people don't realize, um, that AI is already embedded to all of our lives too. I mean, from, if you use Google maps, your smartphone camera, like AI is already here. It's just this generative AI that's opening up all these, all these new conversations as well. Um, well, let's talk about, um, that aha moment when you played with chat GPT four and what was, what was different from chat GPT three, uh, to four when you, um, when you started engaging with it, that when the, when the light bulb went off for you, it was the moment where I felt like I was talking to a person and I knew I wasn't intellectually. I knew this was not a person, but I was having a conversation with it and, it, it wasn't as conversational in 3.5. Uh, it just wasn't as realistic to me. You know, word choice or cadence. Uh, there was a lot about 3. Point, I mean, 3.5, like it still works. I'm not saying it, it doesn't work. But if you've used 3.5 and then you try 4, you, you see immediately the difference. And so I automatically went into experimental mode. And being an entrepreneur, I'm like, well, I'm going to try something different here. And I had this wild idea that, Rather than just asking to AI to to help me write a scene or or to go paragraph by paragraph, like that was the that was the natural transition, and I did that for a little bit, but that was just the starting place. And I thought, why not try and really push the envelope on this technology? Right? Why not really see what it can do uh, in a way that I you know I couldn't accomplish in, in, in you know before it. So I had this thought, like, well, what if what if I co-wrote with AI? But instead of writing it, we performed it. I thought, what if I I took the role as the protagonist and I assigned a role in the story to Chat GPT, and I explained the role, you know, who, who the character was, what the voice was like, what what their needs and motivations were, you know, really good storytelling foundational principles, and and then I gave it a cue and I said, okay, when I you know when I say start in brackets. We are going to be performing in character. And so I'm typing dialogue and chat GPT is typing it back to me. And then when I, when I put the word end in brackets, that's like a cut at the end of the scene. Uh, and I didn't really think past that. I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try this out. And this was the first scene of a new story. So I do that. I hit start and I type something to chat GPT and it responds in character. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is really cool. And we're going through the scene and, and I'm, I'm worrying about like the narrative structure later. Right now I'm just getting the dialogue between myself and chat GPT. And I get to where I feel like the scene is kind of coming to a natural close. And I type the word end in brackets and I hit enter and chat GPT says, well, that's a wrap. That was a great scene. So what are your ideas for the next one? And, and that was the moment where I was like, there's got to be someone on the other side of the screen. Like it not only knew, it not only knew like that the scene ended, but it was already thinking about, okay, well then, then what's next? And the sophistication of that algorithm is, is astounding. And, and I've heard more techie people say, oh, it's just a glorified spreadsheet. It's just an algorithm. It's just math. Don't be so impressed by it. And I'm like, agreed it is, but there is some element that I, there's something in the black box that even some of the engineers can't quite explain. And I know it's in circuitry and I know it's in processors, but that moment for me was just astounding. I, I love everything about this story. And <laughs> I think it's so fascinating. Um, the more or less you were like improv with chat GPT four to build out the dialogue in the scene. And, um, since you first told me about this, I've been dying to play with it myself. <laughs> um, but I, I haven't had a chance just yet with, uh, uh, all the AI, AI events I've been going to here in Cincinnati. Uh, but, but I love that. Um, well, and tell us, um, about the, well, and so, that happened what April of this year. That's yes. uh, and then you launched your newsletter because we both launched our mm -hmm. newsletters around the same time. And you actually wrote some books about how to write with Chat GPT as well. So can you tell us about those and also the uh, the change in trajectory of your Amazon sales too? Because I think some listeners would be really uh, interested in hearing about that as well. Yeah. Uh, as a as a as a lifelong teacher, when I started coming into these moments of discovery and illumination, I thought I need to document this because other people would really benefit from it. 
and really that's all the books have been. I think uh, as of this recording, I think I've published five and basically I figure out how to do something. And then when I have my process, I, on my second monitor, I, I just open up another doc and I start an SOP and I just start documenting exactly what I'm doing. And then, then I eventually turn that into a book so that other people can, can learn how to do it. And even like the, like the story we were just talking about, that has a practical application in so many other ways. Like, you know, you might be thinking, well, I'm not an author, I'm not writing fiction, but are you ever going to go on a job interview? Do you ever anticipate having a difficult conversation with a friend? You can role play, like you can have AI role play in, in the exact same way. You can describe the scenario, you can, you can set the parameters, um, and then, and then and role play and try it out. And it, that's, that's extremely valuable. So uh, it, it's also, and I, I think you and I, because we started our newsletters at the same time, there's, we were definitely at the, on the ascension of the, of the hype cycle. Um, we're probably not there right now, but at that time we were, and there was a lot of interest. And so I capitalized on that. I am being nimble, being an independent publisher, I could make quick moves. And so I did that. I started publishing those books. I started to create AI digest and, and aiming that towards creative professionals. And, uh, and what I noticed is that, you know, I had been publishing on Amazon for a long time and the, the difference in my royalty checks from April to May, one month difference from, you know, before I published an AI book to after was a 10 X difference, uh, which told me that there was a tremendous demand for people learning how to do this. And I think one of the reasons why the books have been so successful, this goes back to our earlier point about the fear. Um, I think there are a lot of people who would like to virtue signal and they, and they like to say like AI is bad and I, and I don't believe in AI and it's taking jobs, but they're curious. And um, so they might not jump into a Facebook group and ask questions or they might not join a webinar or take a course because that outs them as being AI curious. So what they do, what they can do is they can pick up a book and no one's going to know if they read the book. So I have a feeling that my books are are being read by people who are interested in what I'm doing. They're AI positive artists and, and creatives who want to learn from it. But I also think there are a lot of folks who are uh, either skeptical or um, uh, fearful and they're thinking, well, no one's going to know if I read this book and, and maybe that's how they're learning. So I hope that's the case, but it's just a theory. Yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me. And even with this podcast, I've had people tell me like that I personally have put them from a, into the AI curious category. So it's, <laughs> this is very much a, a safe space for whatever viewpoint you have uh, related to, to AI uh, coming here. Um, and, and one thing that I love um, about how you write your books too is that you document everything that you do, but it's really taking... Uh, what was the words that you used, like from prompt to process. Um, yes. So I, I loved how you uh, said that, uh, that little phrase. Um, so could you expand to our listeners and viewers uh, what you mean by that? Yes. Um, I think quite naturally, I think you and I saw the same thing, which was, especially in the spring, you had you had a lot of scammers and, and unscrupulous folks getting on the internet and they were selling, you know, use this chat GPT hack to make $10,000 a day and like just ridiculous things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I think most people realize that those kind of get rich quick schemes or, or just that they're schemes, but you know, some people are taken by them. And as I started working with chat GPT, what I realized was that that wasn't enough. And, and this goes back to my, my days in teaching in that, uh, I taught, very traditionally from like a Socratic dialogue perspective, I really believed in asking questions. That was the best way people learn. They don't, you can't tell someone what to do. No one wants to be told what to do. Uh, and, and so uh, students of any age are, are the same way. And I, uh, I always taught from a very conversational uh, manner and asking questions. And I realized that's what chat GPT is like chat GPT is kind of like a seventh grader right now. Like if you, if you ask it to like do something for you, it's going to do exactly what you say. Like very, it's very concrete. Right. And you're like, no, no, I didn't mean that. I meant this. And then it, and it does something else and it, it will just keep doing exactly what, what you tell it to do, which is a conversation. And so I've really stressed with the people I've worked with that the prompt is only the beginning. And what you have to be, you have to know how to talk to it. You have to know 
how to ask it questions. You have to know what the next response is. So like one, one small tactic that, that folks can use is that if you're not sure what you want, ask chat GPT what it needs to give you what you want. And just that little sort of reframing will get you past the, well, what's the hack that's going to make me a hundred dollars. Cause that kind of stuff doesn't really exist. So when I say prompt over or process over prompt, that's what I'm talking about it is, is, um, is really thinking more about the conversation and the follow-ups uh, that like, you know, a, a single prompt, unless it's something very specific, like, you know, if you want to know the population of a particular city or whatever, like, you know, that might be a single prompt, but most of the time you're working through a process. And for everyone curious about your prompts, you literally copied and pasted and put these in your books, right? Uh, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Uh, the books are a combination of both prompts and examples, and uh, it's really hard to copy and paste from an ebook, and it's impossible from a print book. <laughs> so, in the back of all the books, I give uh, I give the person who purchased the book a link, and then that it's just a Google Doc where they can then save that document on their own. And what I really encourage people to do is to take my prompt and then revise it to fit your particular needs because. It might not serve you exactly the way I have it written, but you'll probably see uh, a path for you based on what I uh, what I used. And I'll be sure to put all the links uh, to Jay's newsletter and where you can find his books uh, and support him and his work and get this treasure trove of SOPs and prompts uh, uh, that he's uh, put out into the world. One of the other things I wanted to ask you about uh, that actually came up in our very first call of having just newsletters is not only your strategy for prompting um, or moving from prompt to process, but actually how you use uh, your newsletter in tandem with your books to kind of cross uh, pollinate the audiences. So I think for some of our authors or anyone creating content and different channels that this might be interesting as well to hear. Yeah, I, I really think that... Um digital books are an underutilized uh, channel for most creative professionals. Uh, you can turn anything into a book, you know, a podcast, a YouTube video, uh, a conversation, an interview, all of that now can easily be transcribed and, and collated and, and turned into text and then sold. And I think what I've always known, because I've, I've really been in the circle for a long time now is that, folks who read email newsletters aren't necessarily the same people who read books and vice versa. And so what I've uh, stumbled upon and, and I, I it's, it was a total accident is that I thought, well, if I have the, the newsletter, what I can do in the newsletters, I can promote the books. And so people who would normally not buy books, if they're, if they know, like, and trust me from the newsletter, they might think, Oh, well, I'll try that because you know, he's showing up every week and delivering value. So they'll, they might go and buy the book. And then on the other side, there might be people who don't subscribe to newsletters and they, they come across my book on Amazon. And when they get to the end, it says, hey, if you subscribe to Creative AI Digest for free, I'll send you a link to all the prompts and then you can just you know, copy and paste them. And for those folks, they go, oh, OK, well, you know what? I don't maybe I don't typically subscribe to newsletters, but this will be worth it. And so I have the synergy going between the email list and the books. And uh, and I do have a lot of experience as an author, and I've done this uh, a fair number of times, but it is very accessible now for anyone, any content creator to turn a single piece of content into a book, upload it to Amazon. Uh, Kindle Direct Publishing is free. Um, you don't pay anything to be on it. Uh, they take a percentage of your sale, but you don't pay to be on it. So you can, you can tap an, uh, an audience that you may not have um, even known about before. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And so you have another book that's coming out soon about editing. And I'm really curious, since you uh, have been an author for a while, how your editing has changed, you know, pre-chat GPT-4 to post-chat G uh, chat GPT-4 and yeah, what your no new book is about uh, and how you're working with your editing team. Yes, uh, this is a this is a very... Uh... I was going to say thorny subject, and that's terrible, but I, I already said it. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, the uh, editors are a little uptight about this. 
they they think AI is going to take their job. And it, to be perfectly honest, it will take some aspects of their job. So like if you are, if you're, if your uh, entire editing business is proofreading, you really right now should be thinking about other ways to service authors, because I think that is a, that is a place where AI is just going to do it better and faster and cheaper. And people probably won't pay for proofreading for that much longer. It might be a year, it might be two years, who knows? So my approach was, what if I could, oh, well, let me back up. So as, as a, uh, someone who did editing for, for authors for years, I always struggled because I thought, wow, if the author could just get this cleaned up, it would allow me to focus on the bigger issues, on sort of the developmental editing, on, on the concepts, on the themes, on the characterization, and, and not get stuck with the grammar and the mechanics and the punctuation. And I thought, that's the gap, right? That's the gap that AI can fill. It can become like an assistant to the editor where an author could take a scene or a chapter at a time. They could give it to chat GPT. I've created this rubric that I, that I use in the classroom for starting in the, in the late nineties that analyzes pieces of writing. So I, I've created the prompt that trains chat GPT, how to analyze with a scene rubric. So the author could put their scene or chapter in uh, fiction or nonfiction and, and they could then chat GPT will give them uh, an analysis of it along with recommendations. The author could ask chat GPT to go ahead and make those, or they could do it themselves and then kind of set that aside and go chapter by chapter. And then when they hand that manuscript to their, their human editor, now you're already starting with something that that's polished and it's only going to be better. So I don't know if this pitch is going to work, but I, I honestly believe this is the stopgap between the author's last revision where they're so close to the work that they're blinded by it. They can't see it anymore. And then before it gets to their editor, I think that's a, that's a place there where AI can really make a difference. And can you kind of break down the difference between um, the chapter to chapter or scene by scene versus the whole book and where the tech is now and why you mentioned the, the more, I guess, scene by scene uh, approach to it? Yes. Uh, technically, uh, Claude 100,000 100, um, context window can accept like a full manuscript but the results have been not been good. So I, I don't think the AI is sophisticated enough yet where you could put your entire manuscript in there and have it go through and, and do what a human editor does. It probably will. <laughs> I, I don't know when, and I don't know what that would look like. Um, and so I decided, well, uh, I want to focus on, on what's available now, on what it can do now. And ultimately, um, my perspective is I was never interested in like click three buttons and create a novel like that as an author, like that, I don't, I don't have any interest in that. Like any artist enjoys the process of being an artist. They don't want that taken away from them. However, I'm happy to use tools. Like, I don't know how many writers today sit down and write their novel on a yellow legal pad. Like they probably don't do that. Right. Cause there are tools that will help them, um, facilitate that story. So that's how I see AI. Uh, and that's why I'm not really interested in sort of that full manuscript scan. I know that that's sort of the holy grail for, for some authors. And, uh, and it may turn out to be where we end up anyways. I don't know. But I just know as an author and editor myself, uh, I think the human input is critical. And I think um, I'm much more on in favor of AI as an analytical tool and a recommendation tool versus a creationist tool. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I know just for our production, both for Creativity Squared and my social media agency, like you already have like baseline word that catches like misspellings. We add a layer of Grammarly, which, you know, apparently I don't use commas the way I should. <laughs> <laughs> and it points it out all the time on top of like the generative AI tools. So um, I know our content is stronger just because we're utilizing the different tools for, for different reasons our, ourselves. Yeah. And you bring up a good example, uh, like Grammarly and pro writing aid and those tools are, are, they're fantastic, but they're on the old model, right? So like what Grammarly, like what you're alluding to is, is Grammarly is like, you've made this comma error like 78 times in this document and you're like, and you have to go through and like, you have to accept all 78 of those commas. Right. And, and that's, I mean, that's, that's the way it's been. That, that, that's fine. 
but it's as an author um, or anyone who does any kind of long form content, that's overwhelming. Like if I turn on pro writing Gator grammarly and it's like, you have, you know, 1,746 errors to fix. I'm like, Oh, I'm groaning. Like I, I want the generative AI just to just fix it. Like, you know, like if, if I've made that same comma error, 70 times, then fix it 70 times, you know, like you're the generative AI. I think that's where I want it to be. And, and, and maybe Grammarly and pro writing aid and those kind of tools will, will offer that. So maybe they're, you know, they're evolving into that. But like when, when people think about AI, like those are kind of glorified spell checkers and, and, and they're good and they're necessary, but that's not the end game. Like the, we're, we're still in the very, very beginning phases of this. Yeah. And for the beginning phases, because you've written both fiction and nonfiction, is there a different approach to the different styles of writing that you take yourself or that you've seen authors take that dip their toes in both fiction and nonfiction? Yes. I, I think the key is uh, is what I call the pre-prompt. And, and uh, OpenAI built this into ChatGPT. I wouldn't recommend it because then it's like a prompt before you type anything. And so if you, you know, your pre-prompt is like, I write, you know, um, you know, romantic fantasy and, and from the perspective of a dragon, and then you forget and like, and then you go in there and you want to write a letter to you, like the gas company who, you know, overbilled you that month. And it's going to be written like a dragon. Cause that's what, you know, the pre-prompt you put in there. Uh, <laughs> that's not necessarily great. Um, <laughs> or it might make someone's uh, customer service day to, to it, it could be a could customer be, right? service response in the voice of a dragon. <laughs> I think you should do that, Helen. You should share it on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I will only be accepting emails in the voice of dragons from there you fans go. this week. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it the, the the differences are the pre-prompt. And like I have a I have like a, a quick guide that um teaches people how to have Chat GPT create what I call a style guide. So you you tell Chat GPT, you know, I'm writing nonfiction. Uh, this is my audience. Uh, I like to use these kinds of words. I like to keep my sentences short, whatever your particular style is. If you put that in as a pre-prompt before you do any of your prompting or process, then you're, you know, you're, you're coming out at like 85 to 90% because now chat GPT understands the kind of uh, output you're looking for. Even like a sample is a great idea. Like that's one place where chat GPT is really strong. If you give it a sample of your writing, even a few paragraphs and you say, take, th here's my sample. Now write the, these bullet points in this style. It's really good that way. So I think it really all comes down to uh, the, the style guide, the, the instructions that you give chat GPT and, and that you're as specific as possible. And because the, you know, the old, the old technical saying of Gigo, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So I think the more you can give chat GPT, the better uh, results you're going to get. Yeah, I love that. And I know you've mentioned multiple times just in our conversation that you have a teacher background and you also have, you know, a strong opinion about uh, teaching chat GPT or these generative AI tools in school. So I thought um, I'd ask you if you wouldn't mind sharing that with our listeners and viewers too. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll date myself by saying I was on the committee at a school one time um, trying to decide whether they should ban this new thing called Wikipedia or not. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and teachers were concerned because anybody could put anything up there. And how do you know if it's valid? And, you know, you, you look back and you hear some of the same things um, that were said in the past or being said uh, about AI now. Regardless of how you feel about AI in education or with young folks, you have to understand that the, the detectors don't work. And in the history of humanity, banning things has never worked. <laughs> I know we keep doing it, whether it's books or technology, and it, it just never works. And so my perspective, you know, I, I predated, I came into the classroom pre-email, pre-smartphone, pre-internet, and every new technology that rolled out, I always took the proactive position of, let's teach these kids how to use this, because it's not going back. It, the genie's not going back in the bottle, right? The, the internet wasn't a fad. Uh, social media is here to stay. Phones aren't going anywhere and neither is AI. And, and so I think we have a responsibility, whether it's kids in school, whether it's uh, within our department, within our agency, 
of of modeling and teaching responsible ethical use. Uh, that to me is the only way forward, and um, remains to be seen. There, there, there's a lot of talk around uh, banning, and 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 I'm not talking about regulation at sort of the the highest levels of of uh, the technology or or industry and commerce. I'm talking more about the end user. I, I think this is a time now where uh, you know, teaching people how to be ethical and responsible could could have benefits for decades to come. Yeah, I, I agree. And one of the uh, missions of the show is to help be a proactive voice uh, in making sure that we're human centered or creating AI tools that are human centered and, and whatnot. And I know uh, what episode it was like three or four with Joanna Pena Bickley. She said um, it would like you, you would be crazy to ban a calculator. So let's right. let's teach. Uh, so I, I definitely have adopted that as well. Um, and you also had kind of um, uh, it's controversial, the right word, uh, maybe bold uh, uh, outlook on the future of AI in the entertainment industry uh, that I'd love for you to to share with our listeners and viewers too, which uh, is a warning that it is very bold. <laughs> yes, I'm a bit reluctant, but uh, you're calling me out on it, so I'll share it. Uh, I wrote an essay about this and um, it's, it might be confusing if someone's listening to this and uh, after everything we've just talked about, but <laughs> yeah. I, I believe that the entertainment industry as we've known it will cease to exist in the near future um, because of AI. And, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So hear me out on this. You know, prior to the, you know, the 20th century, there wasn't an entertainment industry that, that didn't exist. There were entertainers. And there were artists and there were painters and there were musicians and they, they did that for, because they loved it. And some people made a few bucks here and there and, and others love to gather around creatives. That will always be there. I'm not saying that's going anywhere. What I think is going somewhere is the, the ability to make money, a lot of money from creative output. Because if you think about where we are now, it's not hard to imagine an end game where you sit down on your couch and you're like, and Helen, you just say to the room, to your AI assistant, uh, I want to be in a movie, uh, make it an action adventure, set it in Bolivia, about 90 minutes. And uh, I want my, you know, my best friend to, to be my sidekick. And like 30 seconds later, you're going to be watching that. Like, that's not that crazy to imagine now. Um, and I think if we look to the music industry, though, they tend to be the canaries in the coal mine. They were the first ones when when Napster came on board and, and music went digital. Everything that transformed around digital entertainment started there. Uh, and it, it started there a few years ago with uh, the hologram. So uh, I know that Ronnie James Dio and Tupac Shakur, both musicians who have, um, ha who have passed on, have both performed after their deaths as holograms with a full band on stage. And it was polarizing. Some people loved it. Some people hated it. Uh, so the, the technology, if it's not here now, it, it will be here. And so I'd like to say to people, if you really love creating art, by all means, keep doing it, but take some of the financial expectation off of yourself. Like I think the past 10 to 15 years, whether it's uh, musicians or authors or performers, the ability to make a living at that was really an anomaly. It's, it's a blip in human history. It, it's, we're outliers. And I think that era is coming to a close. But like a blacksmith, you know, if you go to Colonial um, Williamsburg in, in Virginia, and there's a blacksmith there and that blacksmith is an expert and they love it and they s might sell a few things there. But like blacksmith isn't an occupation like that's not in the drop down menu when I do my taxes. So people who love working with metal will continue to do that. And that's great. But it's more artistic and it's not necessarily for financial gain in the way that we think of entertainment today. Yeah, I, I find it a really fascinating take. And I've heard different viewpoints as well. Um, one that came from Midwest Con um, this past August is actually 
you know, there's so many independent artists and I'm a little bit more maybe optimistic uh, in, in the <laughs> outlook okay. for artists <laughs> and like, you know, wanting artists to thrive with AI, you know, financially as well. I would just like, there's so many independent artists. There's such a large appetite to consume content that if we had more channels and just ways to connect the creators to the consumers that, uh, whether it's AI generated, human generated, or a combination of AI plus human, that you know the the pie is big enough for all to be able to uh, make it. And, and also, you know, there's been criticism of generative AI in the sense that it all starts to look the same, like have the same you know aesthetic or whatnot. And I really think the human novelty and creativity and point of view that maybe someone like creative people is like, Oh yeah, I want to create my own movie. But like, it goes back to the blank page of like, what do I even want to watch tonight? That would be different than what I asked it, you know, last night, you know, that surprising or serendipitous thing that you wouldn't have even thought that you would have liked, you know, I, I feel like there's still like a tons of space uh, for humans and humans plus AI to create these, these surprising things, uh, yeah, in, and, in and art too. Absolutely. And, and another counter argument to what I just said, which is why I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not we're, dogmatic. We're not holding it, it to you, Joe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're putting lots of ideas out there. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, one, one friend of mine said, but you know, humans really enjoy art socially. Uh, so, you know, you like to be watching the same show as your friend or you want to go to a movie together or you go to a gallery together and you experience things with other people. So I recognize like that might be that might be still viable, you know, like um, there might be artists who cater to that and there might be people who want to be part of something bigger than, than themselves as opposed to just sitting on the couch and generating their own movie and watching it. There's a shared experience that I'm I'm recognizing has value and that might save the industry. Uh, you know, from, from total doom. (laughs) (laughs) I guess uh, time will tell where where things land. I hope I'm wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Well, and I, this is a little bit of a tangent too about, uh, the Tupac, uh, hologram, you know, I, that's something, um, that's, you know, Black Mirror, that series has explored about what happens to our digital identities. And you already see it even pre-Gen AI's explosion of, you know, a lot of us have a lot of our lives on social media where our personalities can also be extracted from what we've shared. Now we have, um, you know, cloning ourselves and these Gen AI tools um, that can really replicate styles. Like, what does that mean for... um, in immortality in these digital forms and i'm actually not 100 percent opposed to like my digital clone living on way past me if, <laughs> if the world wants it if it's something that could help with like generational wealth or you know or art manifesting itself in different ways in the future and having some entity of you know, my art created, I don't know, I wouldn't call my clone art, but um, (laughs) touching that, like, I'm not actually, I'm not 100% opposed to that. But I feel like a lot of artists who put their stuff out there, you know, is to survive generations, and we're just seeing the evolution into digital form. So I don't know if you thought about this with your writing at all, because that I mean, that's kind of putting a mark for for generations, too. Yeah, I don't know. I was thinking more about uh, Helen 2.0. And I got this, I got to see her in Cincinnati. And I don't know, I think there might be a future <laughs> there for her. But, uh, no, you know, I haven't, I haven't thought about it necessarily from our writing only because the medium is a little different. But I'll tell you where I have thought about it. Uh, like we we are we're in a time now where I think maybe sort of the last international movie stars are are heading into middle age and and some of them are are passing on. Um, you know, Bruce Willis is a great example, right? Like, you know, um, Bruce Willis has had some health challenges and he's not going to be acting anymore. And I could see, you know, a few years down the road, I could see the you know a, a Hollywood production company going to the Bruce Willis estate and offering to buy his likeness for. $5 billion and like 
he's gone. And what do they care? Like they'll make $5 billion. And now we have new Bruce Willis movies, which I love. I love a Bruce Willis movie. So I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it, but I, I, I think that, um, and, and of course, you know, not everyone is Bruce Willis, but I, I do think there is going to be the opportunity uh, to carry that forward. If you want, I think the big question is, you know, who's going to want it. And uh, I don't, I don't think my fiction is good enough that people are generations from now are going to be craving it, but you know, uh, for Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt and, and those, those folks, uh, Angelina Jolie and Halle Berry, maybe they have a future in that. Uh, it could be, a, you know, the, the sleeper cult classic that emerges later down the line day. <laughs> yeah. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I know we could keep going and going, um, but uh, let's plug your newsletter and any of your book projects or coaching or courses uh, that you'd like to to plug for our, our uh, listeners and viewers. Yeah, thanks, Ellen. Uh, everything is at the creative at creativeaidigest.com. Uh, that's where the newsletter is. You, you can subscribe and there's a little tab there for books uh, that you can easily get to all the books uh, I've published this year on AI and other books about storytelling, if that's your jam. Awesome. And again, I'll be sure to put all the links to all of this and all the descriptions and the episode specific uh, blog post. And if you want our listeners and viewers to remember one thing uh, from today's conversation or about AI and writing in general, what would you like that one thing to be? Just be kind. Just be kind to each other. You don't know what people are going through and what their situation is. And don't rush to judgment. Just, just be kind to each other. I fully, fully support that 100%. So Jay, it has been so wonderful having you on the show. And uh, yes, if you haven't subscribed already to his newsletter, be sure to do it. And hopefully we'll get you back down in Cincinnati to for another uh, Cincy AI meetup before long. Thanks, too. Helen. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for spending some time with us today. We're just getting started and would love your support. Subscribe to Creativity Squared on your preferred podcast platform and leave a review. It really helps. And I'd love to hear your feedback. What topics are you thinking about and want to dive into more? I invite you to visit creativitysquared.com to let me know. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our free weekly newsletter so you can easily stay on top of all the latest news at the intersection of AI and creativity. Because it's so important to support artists, 10% of all revenue Creativity Squared generates will go to ArtsWave, a nationally recognized nonprofit that supports over 100 arts organizations. Become a premium newsletter subscriber or leave a tip on the website to support this project and ArtsWave. And premium newsletter subscribers will receive NFTs of episode cover art and more extras to say thank you for helping bring my dream to life. And a big, big thank you to everyone who's offered their time, energy, and encouragement and support so far. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. This show is produced and made possible by the team at Play Audio Agency. Until next week, keep creating.